Hi, this is Jack Stanley, and I'm doing part two of the 125-foot horn. I've been remiss. I've been meaning to do this, and I haven't done it in a little while, so um, I want to add to what I did already. I already did part one. Part two, I want to continue talking about some of the stuff that was done there. Now, of course, in part one, I talked about its construction, so I don't need to go there. But it was a very unique device, and I will say that there were many attempts to change the size of the end piece of the horn. They changed it to various sizes. There were several uh, work orders made that were in the papers of the Columbia Street Studio. Also, the telephone line that ran in between the Columbia Street Studio building where they did the performance and the building where they made the recordings 125 feet separated, of course, was always breaking down. They were always having problems with it, and they had to resort to yelling back and forth across the horn. Well, they did lots of experiments. They did lots of piano recording. As I mentioned, the piano seemed to be perfect for that horn, and Ernest Stevens did a good deal of those recordings. A number of other people did some, and of course the Stevens Trio and Quartet would uh, do experiments. Another thing that was done were silence or horn tests in which they would just record the sound of the horn to see if it made any sounds. Also, they did experiments uh, with cylinders. Now, here's an interesting thing with the Edison Company that people don't think of. In the earliest days of the Edison Company as a phonograph company, it was pure cylinder. The disc market did not become a factor until, well, commercially until about 1912. And the thing is that there were a number of individuals who recorded not only for the Victor Talking Machine Company, but also for Edison. But it was very clear on their contracts that they could make cylinder recordings for Edison and disc recordings for Victor. So when the Edison company went into the diamond disc, and to a degree the cylinder took a back seat to it, a number of performers were lost, such as Harry Lauder, Victor Herbert, and I have to tell you, with Victor Herbert, uh, he was happy to get out of the whole area around Edison. He was actually the director of artists and repertoire for a short while for Edison, and Edison drove him nuts. Eventually, he just got so angry he quit and left. But there were a number of cylinder recordings made um, of uh, Victor Herbert's orchestra that they did experiments playing the cylinders and trying to record them as discs. They tried it with Harry Lauder. They also tried it with Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt made a series of recordings um, in 1912, and uh, they tried to transfer those to disc as well. None were very successful. They also did other experiments as well. Um, they did distance tests. They tried to create new sounds. I mean, Edison would stand outside of the Columbia Street studio with a hammer and bang on walls and trying to create new sounds that might be interesting. Another thing was that it was used for assemblies. They tried to record a whole grouping of, or of, of instruments. And there again, we ran into that whole problem with uh, it being extremely directional and also the problem of capturing the sound of all the instruments. They had niches all over where people could climb up so they could play into the horn at different angles. And of course, they use lauder pianos. Now, always lauder. That was the brand that Edison said sounded best. However, there was a series of problems, for Edison at least. If jazz had been played upon a lauder piano one too many times, it was jazzed out 
and the piano was no good. So, what they would have to do is take trips to the Lauder Piano Company of Newark, New Jersey, and find a new one. Now, of course, this was an arduous affair because Edison had to listen to each piano. They went through all the pianos until he heard one that sounded right for him. And that would be brought to the Columbia Street studio and used for a short while until it had had jazz played on it and was ruined. And then you had to go back and do it again and again. There were recordings made of trumpeters. There were recordings of all types made on this horn. The end result of the 125-foot horn experiment was it was pretty much a failure as to what it was going to do. As I said in part one, the whole idea was to untangle music, as Edison liked to put it. And this was just at the point of time when Bell Labs is doing all their experiments uh, on sound and coming up with uh, the logarithmic horn and, of course, what will become the orthophonic Victrola, which everybody in the Edison company liked to make fun of. Walter Miller, perhaps to please Edison, said it sounds like music coming out of a rain barrel. And, of course, no one particularly cared for the 125-foot horn, except for Edison. And by 1925, it was kind of a moot point and experiments were pretty well dropped. And it sat there for years and years and years until World War II, long after Edison was dead, and it was sold in a scrap drive. But the recordings made on the 125-foot horn are really quite unique and interesting. Awful lot of test recordings were made. And, of course, there again, with acoustic recording, and recording on wax, the weather affects things drastically. And so they would often record the weather when they made a recording. And a lot of times, even though they would put people in the same position and play the same music, if they did it on another day, the weather conditions could be such that the recording wouldn't come out the same. So it was somewhat of a hit or miss effort. And a number of the recordings were released from the 125-foot horn, but more were rejected than accepted. But it was a novel, most unique moment in acoustic recording, because there had never been anything like it, nor would there ever be anything like it again. And, of course, the 125-foot horn became one of the last major efforts by Thomas Edison, not by the Edison Company, but by Thomas Edison in the field of recording. After this, he kind of takes a back seat. Charles is more in charge. They go into long play recording, which was a problem to begin with, which they did in the Columbia Street Studios just transferring regular Diamond Disc records onto a very, very uh, tightly grooved series of uh, records. Uh, also, the other thing is, in the Columbia Street Studios, they would work on experiments eventually in electrical recording, which Edison said was rotten. And also, they also did the cinema music experiment, which were made for movie studios, which was Theodore's baby. I remember seeing the Cinemusic horns. They were huge, and they had holes in them, too. And Theodore had figured out where the bass response would be best by putting holes in the horn. Very interesting how that all worked out. Unfortunately, these very slow-moving, like 16 RPM uh, recordings on Edison discs never became feasible. And lastly, the last things they did there were a couple of electrical recordings and thank you recordings or um, for vending machines, you know, smoke a lucky advertising stuff. So that's enough on this. I've talked enough. And uh, this is uh, part two.